So I find it interesting to reflect on the fact that my whole life as a Christian, and I was raised in the church, I was raised in the Lutheran church, a small denomination in a small congregation, very ordinary, nothing flashy. <clears throat> but from then through to uh, high school when I joined a youth group, and you know, it was still just a pretty ordinary youth group and a pretty ordinary congregation that we were participating in. The whole time I've had this Christian identity and this participation in church, the church has been in decline. And my guess is that for, I'd say most, but I think all of us here, we've really only experienced the Christian life when the institution of church has been in a steady decline. And I've wondered lately what that does to our psyches. What does it do to your sense of Christian identity if the entire time you've been alive, the institution of this thing has been in decline and you've been the bad guy in every movie? Isn't that weird? Isn't it weird that you watch a movie and somebody's like, I'm a priest, and you're like, that's the bad guy. I know it for sure. He's killing people in the back room. Like, Because as soon as someone is Christian, they're pegged in our popular culture as a negative character. There's a couple exceptions, but not a lot, you know? And it wasn't always this way. In a lot of our most famous books and foundational stories, priests and shepherds and spiritual leaders have been the people that had integrity. But something has shifted in the last couple of decades, and now we have a very different public narrative about what this is and what it means. And in some ways, I think there were benefits to being sort of always a, a minority by being a Christian. And I know that like when you hear this, some of you are like, oh, but Republicans, I just want to remind you, we're not in America. Don't know if you've noticed. Like I know in America there's Christians fighting for all the power and they use the Christian label to get power, but I don't know anyone who's ever using their Christian voice to get a bunch of power. You might find like a handful of congregations in small towns around Ontario, but do you know them? And maybe you know like one, but how many churches do you know that are just normal, faithful churches, and maybe they're a little one way or the other, and maybe they have their opinions, but they're not like the vestiges of power. That's not been our story. We have lived in a culture where being a Christian has always put you a little on the out if you're connected to regular secular society. How many of you, when you mention that you go to church, or maybe somebody sees your little Christian tattoo that's only so subtle, you know? Because <clears throat> you put important things on your body. So they're like, oh, you're religious, you're Christian. You're like, oh, oh uh, well, yes, uh, maybe not that kind. You know, like you just, because you can feel it. You can feel that it's different. And for a long time, that different actually gave me a clearer sense of identity. Because it's good to be a little on the outs. You know, it, it gave me a sense of like, this is who I am. This is my tribe. This is my faith. There was a dignity to being Christian for a lot of my life, even though I was often in a minority perspective when it came to religion. And this text, always be prepared to give a defense and articulation of the hope that you have within you. I was prepared. I liked it when people asked me questions about faith. I liked it when they were curious about God. I'd want to respond. I'd have questions for them. And maybe even if you feel a little uncomfortable sometimes when religion is, you know, brought up as a topic, when someone asks you about prayer or church, maybe you felt a little uncomfortable, but, but come on, tell me you haven't ever felt a little alive. Like, ooh, the stakes are high. Now I represent something. Oh, I gotta speak, Lord have mercy. You know, it kind of feels good to be in a place where you have to articulate something fresh, something different, something that maybe, maybe others have actually had a little bit of a muddy perspective on. But then, over the last, I'd say especially 15, 10 years, I've noticed that it hasn't felt as good. And it starts with testimony. I meet people who are carrying around with them incredible wounds that are tied sometimes to church communities 
or to people who participated in church community with them. And I hear these testimonies about ways that people have been rejected, have felt rejected, have been ostracized or pushed to the margins, have felt like they've been pushed down or pushed away or attacked. Or you learn some of the history of church and you realize that the history of the church is not only the history of saints bringing God's light into the world, but also a history that is tied right into colonization and oppression, and very rarely with like the intent to do harm, but very often with the ignorance of not knowing what we were participating in, and allowing systems that have nothing to do with our Christian way to dictate how the church lives her life. And then, you know, as if testimony in history wasn't enough to begin to like shatter my faith in church, we got Instagram. And boy, you know what travels quickly on social media? Bad news. And, and, and stories of bad news. And little screen caps and new podcasts sharing all the bad news and sharing all the horrible things that have happened. And before long, I felt like the church had nothing good to offer at all. In fact, it just seems to be causing undue harm all over the place, only bad things all the time. It was like a, a, a sweater when it has like one thread that, you know, is out, popped out. And you, you start to pull that thread and you pull it and you pull it and you find more and you find more and you find more and before long you've unraveled half the sweater, you've got a little crop top and you're thinking like, hey, I've either got to stop pulling on this if I want to have a sweater or I got to make sure I know how to knit. And through this time, I think we just, the, the language I've been using, we just became a little backfooted. You know, like, we just, we just kind of felt like we always had to be on the defense, always explaining what we meant when we used Christian language, always explaining what our church was like, and saying, and, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, somebody says, are you a Christian? How many of you have said, oh yeah, I'm Christian, but I'm not like that kind of Christian. Be honest, right? How often have we wanted to say, oh yeah, I'm part of the family, but not like, I don't hang out with those cousins, you know? That family's crazy. That uncle's nuts. I'm over here with this crazy uncle. So I, I, I want to just articulate for a moment, I guess how on the, in this back foot posture, how we can both become more comfortable when it's time for us to offer a defense, and maybe to allow us to just recognize inside of ourselves what our posture is. And if we've been on our back foot for a long time, maybe it's time to shift our posture. There's a time for going on your back foot. There's a time to deconstruct and take it apart. But it's just a time. And you can't stay there. Because when you're on your back foot, you're actually kind of vulnerable to being pushed over. So we need to shift our posture eventually. And, uh, and maybe we can just do some, some reflecting on this together in a way that will help us internally and, and you know, personally for each of you to leave this place and meditate on what it might mean to be on that back foot and then if there are ways that the Spirit might be inviting you to shift your posture. I think that, you know, I don't have a lot of time, so I only can really offer one or two reflections on this. I think if I had to offer one, it might be this. Yes, the church has been on our back foot and been a little defensive, and it's been necessary for the time, but I, I actually think overall it is not strictly necessary that we always be in a defensive posture. Because I think that the church, despite all the ways that we participated in injustice, and we've had corruption, I don't think the church has been wildly more corrupt than any other place where human beings get together to do something. And I know that's sort of like controversial because there's been a lot of corruption. But I guess my question lately has been, if you're going to get a, a group of humans together to actually cohere over generations together, 
and build real community in places where different worlds interact and all the good that happens in church can happen. My question is being, what is, what's an appropriate amount of corruption, you know? Like, hear me out. Every institution has some corruption. Like, I don't know if you've heard, but the banks? It's actually not perfect over there. Shocker. You know, they, they started by saying, let us hold your money, and then they started saying, we like making money. Like, that's a crazy, that's like letting your, I shouldn't make drug dealer references, there's children in the room, but you know, like, you, you, can't, get, you can't let them like having money. You know, the banks have had a bit of corruption. And I don't know if you've been to the uh, supermarket recently, but the grocery stores have a little bit of corruption. And I've been told that even those wonderful nurses and doctors exist in a world where there's a little bit of corruption. There's corruption in the banks. There's corruption in the market. There's corruption in the school system. There's corruption everywhere. And the older something is, and the larger it is, at a statistical level, you are bound to see some level of corruption. How naive would we have to be to believe that human sin wouldn't participate in a holy place like the church? And it gives me some comfort, actually, that we were outraged by the church's corruption. Because it means that we expect better. It means that we still consider this holy and sacred. Because when there's corruption in the banks, Nobody got upset. Nobody even pulled their money. We just all went, that's really bad, and funding wars. Life's full, and we just kept going. And maybe we should change what we do, and you know, we can do all that conversation, but you're going to be participating in unjust systems if you're living in an unjust world. Why would the church be the one institution that when we see its corruption, we not only judge it, but we leave it and, and we refuse to participate in it when we don't act that way with all of our other institutions. And in fact, we know that the only way that these institutions can ever repent, be turned back to the light, become healthier, is by the participation of people who still have their souls. It is the honest person in business who can help redeem the world of business. It is the courageous politician who can call a political party to accountability. It will be the Christians who see the corruption in the church who are most capable of praying and seeking a better way and asking God to expunge the sin from the church and to cultivate the life that the church can have, even when it's ordinary and normal and regular. It will be ordinary, regular saints who participate in the church to create the kind of culture that can bring the kind of life that the church needs and that the city needs. Can I get an amen? Are we amen? Okay. I don't, we're in defense mode. I don't know if we're in amen mode yet, you know? like. Next week, I'll be like, can we get a fire and brimstone? Fire and brimstone. But this week, maybe we'll just get some amens. I think we have forgotten how good an ordinary Christian church can be. I was at our uh, Canadian Baptist assembly gathering this weekend. It's a gathering of... <clears throat> 500 or so people representing like 300 congregations from all across Ontario and Quebec. They're all congregations kind of like this, pretty ordinary, normal people gathering to worship. And I kept being struck by the stories I'd hear and the people I met and that there were, there just seemed to be a lot of little good things happening all over. But the one that really struck me was I was walking down the hallway and I saw this man and he was an older man he was holding a little baby, maybe like a one-year-old, who was struggling to sleep, and he was you know, bouncing the baby on his lap, and he just looked so normal, and he was smiling, and he was patting the butt. And I walked by, and I assumed that given the man's age and the baby's age, that this must be his grandchild. So I walked by, and I said, oh, that looks, that looks nice. And he smiled back, and he said, oh, it's nice. And I said, uh, grandchild? And he said, foster kid. 
Beautiful. So I went over and I met Peter, the foster dad, and, uh, and little Liam, the baby. And Liam was, you know, moving and he goes, oh, you know, I've got, I've got so many stories about these foster kids and, oh man, like the way our hearts have expanded by having them here. And oh, the, just offering care to this little baby. He starts to tell me about how this baby had spent the last couple of months on morphine, trying to break cycles of addiction. He talked about how they will, whenever they have foster kids, they'll bring them into their church. And the first thing they do is the whole congregation gathers around the baby to anoint the child with oil and to lay hands and pray. And he said, you wouldn't believe the miracle stories we've had of like gray matter in the brain growing at a level that the doctors at sick kids end up saying, you know, this is a miracle. You know, he's telling me stories about kids that have felt such a, a sense of love that decades later they reach back out and say, there was something in your care, even though I hardly remember it, there was something there that, that showed me what, what selfless and true love looked like. And he was just telling me these stories and telling me these stories. This is a guy who's living three hours north of North Bay. So we're talking just like your kind of normal small town church. And at one point I said, like, this is amazing. How long have you been doing this? He goes, oh, you know, decades and decades. I go, how, how many kids have you had? And he goes, uh, little Liam here is uh, 62. Hey, how come that's never on Instagram? There's, there's Peter's in every church, right? And I know Peter's a bit of an extreme example. Some of you here are like, 62. I, I was like, 62. He was like, well, some of them have been for as short as one night, and some have been as long as three and a half years. And, you know, he was telling us all these stories. I started crying. I just couldn't fathom that this is just a normal guy, a part of a normal church, and this is what normal churches do. And, you know, if you want it, like, really, like, on the defense kind of, front here, like think about us, like some of you know each other. Take a second, look around the room, just look for someone you know here. Would you say the people gathered in this room are a moral drain on society? <laughs> Would you say the people in this room are really just like not offering much to the public life of this city? Or would you say that, yes, even if our congregation is relatively average, we don't have, like, incredible ministries, we're not, like, overflowing on Sunday, we're not, like, some super church. We're, like, an average church, pretty normal, and yet, even in a pretty normal church, I can look around and see people who, through their work, and through their neighborhood, and through their love, and their friendships, and their families, and their art, and their passions, and their justice, I see people here engaged in every issue that plagues this city. I know that you give your bodies to it, and I know that you pray through it and give your spirit to it. The people in this room are remarkable, and we're not even that good at it. So why, why aren't we defending our faith? I know on Instagram there was a bad church somewhere in America. But why aren't we defending what we actually see with our own eyes? What we actually feel when we embrace one another and extend peace? Why are we not allowing our experience to be authoritative? And why are we trusting an algorithm and a public narrative, often led by businesses and brands who would love it if we left religion, because that gives a lot of attention and money for them, but we'll get there next week. Why would we dismiss our home when actually a lot of what we've seen, even in an ordinary place, is pretty good? Think through your history. I'll give you a moment and close your eyes if you're that kind of person. Think through your own experience of church. Try to be thorough. And... Try to be honest. What did the church give you? I should say properly, what did God give you through the church? But for many of us, our, our way of thinking, which yes, has some weaknesses, but has all sorts of goodness, our way of thinking came through the church. A sense that there was an eternal love that loves you perfectly, even when you don't deserve it. 
that is a gift. Think about friendships, relationships, communities that you met through someone you met at church. Think about the places you've moved to and where you met the people that you met and how you felt like you were beginning to find home. What role did the church have in that? And you could zoom out even beyond congregations, like beyond one congregation, one Sunday community. Zoom out to the church mystic and cosmic. All those who do the will of God are my brothers and my sisters and my mothers. Think through your history. And I hope you find that without discounting any of the pain that has also come by being a part of this cosmic family, I hope you can look at it and say that really overall, it is good. It is good. All right, if you close your eyes, you can open them again. <laughs> I'm going to start wrapping up. <clears throat> it's Father's Day, so I thought it was the most fitting time to talk about mothers. Uh, the language of the church has often been that the church is our mother. And like, can, I just, can, we just, like, can we just level with each other for a moment? How perfect is that? How perfect of a meta, how Freudian perfect is it that the church is our mother? And also, my mom's here today. My, hi mom. Didn't know that was gonna happen when I was prepping this sermon, so now I've called it out. Forget, look this way, look, look this way, look this way. Uh, the church is our mother, which is so funny because our mother's like our first comforter, our nurturer. She brings us into this world and by her body, she nourishes us with love and care and cleaning and washing and feeding. Our mother listens to us, attends our first eye contact, bouncing on her knee, mother. And then we age and we want some independence, but our mother is there also saying, I must warn, I must give wisdom. I am wisdom, lady wisdom, mother. And then we wander away, can we do our own thing? And our mother's like, I don't like what you're doing over there. And we're like, mother, mother. And then you get caught in some really bad sin and your whole world blows up and you're like, mommy. <laughs> and you're back at church and you're all sad. Oh, my sins caught up to me. I need to go back to church, mommy. And it's like, I'm joking about it, but like, that's what we do when we're hurting, don't we? We cry out for spiritual mother. We cry, I need to go somewhere where mother will be. It's so perfect. The church is our mother. And there may be all sorts of tensions with our mothers earthly and with our mothers spiritually. But we can't just get rid of mother. I know, bro. He get, the kids get it, man. And they're going to get it because they, they know what this world's like. And they know that mothers don't come easy. You don't get a lot of mothers in this life. And if we dismiss our church, our mother, we will fall into all sorts of other places that are not our mother and do not love us. And I say all this, by the way, recognizing, as we all recognize, that the church reflects this mothering impulse to varying degrees of perfection and imperfection. And harm occurs, and some of you have mothers that you have very complicated relationships with, and there can be pain, and congregations can be places that you have to leave because they're not healthy. All of that is stated, but at a cosmic level, the church is our mother. And we should, in a proper, honest way, defend our mother. I've been thinking of a metaphor for this, a bit of a parable, if I can share this working parable in progress with you. I think that leaving the church and like deconstructing your faith, taking it all apart, it's like having dinner with your mother. 
So imagine you're going to your mother's house for dinner and your mother's serving you like good hot lasagna. Like who doesn't love a good lasagna, you know? You sit down and there's hot lasagna and your mom's there and there's a candle and you're gonna eat together. But then there's this closet in the kitchen. And every time you've tried to go in that closet, your mom's like, don't go in the closet. I got all my old stuff in the closet. You don't need to go into the closet. So then you go and, you know, you eat your meal. But then the next week you go back and you're eating with your mother. You're like, oh, I want to check out that closet. And your mom's like, don't go into the closet. It doesn't matter. There's lots of stuff in there. We don't need to worry about it. But one week you're like, no, before we eat lasagna, I'm opening that closet. I want to see what's in that closet. And so you open up the closet and stuff like falls out right away. So there's just so much in that closet. Your mother's been alive a long time. Your mother has been gathering stories and artifacts and a whole history from before you were even born. And you look at your mother's stuff and some of it's kind of strange and some of it's really beautiful and some of it she's like, oh, I forgot about that. That's this beautiful thing that I put in here years ago. And some of it she's like, oh, don't look at that. And she's like throwing it away before you can really notice. You find old photos and you're going through all the old photos and you see all your mother's old friends and you see all the people that she's been around and you see all of her mistakes and you see all of her gifts and by the end of this process, you know, it takes you like hours to sort through everything that was in this closet but at the end of it, you and your mother, you've seen it all. You know her history. You, you understand her more. You have more empathy but also you see her brokenness more than you did before. And then eventually together you put everything packaged up and you put it back into the closet and you close the closet and then you have a decision to make. Do you want to eat dinner? And there's nowhere else to go eat dinner. If you want to eat with your mother, then you just have to sit down after digging through the closet and you just need to have the meal. And if you do, it will be a little lukewarm because he spent all that time digging through the closet. But you had to, eventually. And then next week, when you go back for dinner, you can just decide that you don't need to look in the closet anymore. Because you've done it, and you've decided that even though you know what's in there, you'd rather eat with your mother. It's not like Jesus levels parable, but Few of us can. Last thing. The sermon is called In Defense of Church. And it's been good to articulate this and, and to even just read the, the faces and the spirit of this collective. Like, thank you for going on this journey, maybe even a little uncomfortable at times, journey. But ultimately, the reason that we love our mother is because our mother connects us to our family. And our family is where our Father Almighty comes from, and our brother Christ, who is our head, comes from. And so whatever we think of the family, and whatever tensions we have with our mother, let us remember that our mother is our link to God and to Christ. And Christ is Lord of the cosmos, and God is God of all people. And those outside of the church can encounter the living God, and they do. And it's beautiful. But the church is the one place where you're going to hear about Jesus every week. Every week. You're just going to hear the name of Jesus. Even in the like super liberal ones that hardly believe in God anymore, you still hear the name of Jesus. Even in the super conservative ones that are trying to like overthrow the government, you still hear the name of Jesus and you might read about him in the Bible and go, whoa, these guys are crazy, but Jesus is great. Like the church is so good because she gives us the name of Jesus every single gathering. And for Christ's sake, we ought to love and defend our mother. Amen.